Okay, we've had so many requests for this recording and so much, and as you, I think some more people are trickling into. So glad there is, it must be a, a real need for information about what I'll call, well, I'll have to use the air quotes, CRT, um, just for short, to represent all of the political, educational, cultural, and emotional concepts that CRT seems to carry. I'm hoping that this evening we can clear up all of the inaccurate and misunderstood parts so we all leave with a better understanding of what CRT is, what it isn't, and why we're even here talking about it this evening. And to get to that place, we are so lucky to have the Reverend Dr. Arturo Pierre Lewis with us. Uh, Arturo is an American Baptist Church's USA minister an author, a real life mentor, an and an inspirational speaker who works with adults, students, professional athletes, and corporate executives um, in both religious and non-religious settings. Arturo founded and directs the um, Direct Celebration Education and Celebration Ministries, and he is associate pastor at Emmanuel Church in Ridgewood. Uh, he is also co-director of the Community Peace and Justice Network and adjunct faculty at William Patterson University. I've had to really cut this short because believe me, he's extremely busy, as I mentioned. So his Arturo's childhood happened so close and yet so far away. Um, he grew up poor in some of the most dangerous neighborhoods of Patterson, a historic place for more than one reason. Um, city in New Jersey. Arturo is one of 12 children raised by his mother after his parents uh, had a violent separation. Um, through sports, church, and education, uh, he maneuvered his way beyond gang life, um, drug use, and crime. And now he holds several degrees, including a bachelor's degree, two master's degree, and a doctorate from Drew University Theological School. Um, Somehow, he is also a pregame speaker for professional sports teams, <laughs> combining his background in radio and semi-professional um, baseball. He volunteers as a board member of the Ridgewood YMCA and lives with his wife in Ridgewood, New Jersey. So that is, we are very lucky to have um, Arturo here tonight. And then I'll just say a few little housekeeping uh, rules or guidelines for this evening. I'd like everyone to keep their um, any comments or um, documents, any resources, like somebody has just added to the chat about the um, Community Peace and Justice Network uh, website, about in their information about their programs um, to the chat. So if you'd like to have any comments, resources, phone numbers, websites, documents, anything like that, you can add it to the chat. Uh, but you can keep your questions to the Q&A format and Arturo will speak for a bit and then we can answer some questions and we can go back and forth just because the questions um, might be inspired by something he is talking about right then. And you can also have, you have the option to ask questions uh, and honestly, anonymously. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you can ask to, uh, for me to turn on your video sharing and you can ask your question on camera. Um, so, I think that, oh yeah, we still have some more people coming in, but I think for that I am ready to get started and I will let you take over now, Arturo. Thank you. Larissa, thank you so very much for that, uh, for inviting me. And uh, just so that no one gets nervous, I know that's way too many things for one person to do. Thankfully, I don't do them every single day. They are periodic, many of them, but I am so, glad and grateful to be here this evening to be a part of uh, this conversation. Um, I am a part of a community here in Ridgewood and a faith community specifically, Emmanuel Church, um, who uh, supports the work that I am doing with them because the work that we do is a collaboration and I'm just, I'm just honored to be here uh, tonight and to have a conversation with you and with our uh, fellow participants. So I know that what we wanna talk about is critical race theory. And what I thought I'd do is share a uh, definition, provide a bit of a description of what critical race theory is, um, perhaps address some of 
the misunderstandings uh, about uh, CRT. And I, then I know you and I will have an opportunity to engage each other and then welcome in our friends as well. So let's get right at it. So critical race theory uh, really is a part of some of the work that we're doing uh, with this project we started shortly after the murder of George Floyd, uh, the Community Peace and Justice Network, uh, which is a platform out of Emmanuel Church, uh, hosts the Race Together Learnings About Race and Racism in America. And since last October, what we've attempted to do is to address various topics that are impacted by race and racism in America. And so I shared with our participants last Tuesday, we meet uh, the uh, third Tuesday of each, second Tuesday, I'm, I'm sorry, the third Tuesday of each month uh, at seven. And I shared with our participants uh, last week that when we get finished in November, we will have just gotten started uh, because when we are, looking at race and racism in America, we're talking about uh, something that has been a part of America since its inception. Critical race theory attempts to help us to understand just that. And so it's, it's born out of legal scholarship that was initiated by Derek Bell. Derek Bell, who, uh, worked with the Legal Defense Fund, uh, who worked with Thurgood Marshall, who taught among other places at Harvard as a law professor. Um, his work uh, attempts to use um, scholarship, a, a, a critical examination, looking at the intersection of race and law in America and challenge some of the mainstream liberal approaches to racial justice. And, and that's worth noting because often I'm abbreviating critical race theory as many uh, have done by referring to it as CRT. So what's interesting about this is that uh, Bell, Professor Bell um, began to um, write, think and write and teach about this not in response to a conservative perspective on race and racism, but a more liberal one, because his concern was that some of the approaches that were taken may not have been the best strategies. And so what CRT tries to do is look at uh, the social aspects, the cultural and legal issues, primarily in the U.S., and how they relate to race and, and racism. Because he or his perspective was, a part of his perspective, was that racism in America objectifies people and degrades people, and therefore uh, people of color, people who are not white, in America have always been and are disadvantaged for those reasons. And so continuing uh, along this line of thought here, this, so the, the academic movement is trying to look at some power dynamics um, because those who control uh, the wealth and the power in the United States of America are those who are more advantaged, are those who are going to be more privileged at the disadvantage of those who do not have that access to power simply because of the color of their skin or because of the ethnic group that they are a part of. And so the theorists who um, study uh, critical race theory, people like professors uh, Crenshaw Thomas and Williams at Columbia Law School who are really um, carrying this uh, work forward um, are looking at some of the foundations of the liberal order in our country. And they're examining rationalism, uh, constitutional law and legal reasoning. And what they're 
what they're finding or what they're unpacking is that from the very beginning of of America's uh, implementation, um, what was established was a social life with a very firm, powerful uh, political structures and an economic system that's founded upon race. We know that there were indigenous persons of color, Native Americans who already occupied this land, who therefore were not of uh, uh, white and therefore immediately devalued. Uh, we know that the Atlantic slave trade brought a uh, free laborers to the US for the sole purpose of being able in a very rapid way, develop uh, the wealth of, of this country. And, and, and so a quick interjection here, right? When, when I think about how often we laud and celebrate uh, the, the wealth and the growth of the United States of America and how did this possibly happen in such a young country, let's talk about the free labor system, right? So way before the, the explosion of, of, uh, of, of, of the industrial revolution, it was the plantation economy that was driven by free labor that established the wealth uh, in what became the United States of, of America. So- I interrupt you, but I love that. I thought it's really ahead. interesting. I thought it's interesting that you use the term free labor because yeah. it's only free in one sense. That's <laughs> yeah. right, that's right. Absolutely, because a, a tremendous cost was paid by uh, persons from Africa. <laughs> there was nothing free about it for, for them. Uh, but I, I imagine, and, and I, I asked the students that, that I teach, would you want to work and not get paid? Would you want to be treated inhumanely? And of course, the, immediately res the immediate response to that is, is, is no. So legal and cultural practices are some of what uh, CRT is, is attempting to, to examine. And, and so uh, Bell and, and Thomas and Crenshaw and Williams and so many others have written uh, very succinctly and with a clear scholarship that racism in America has always been internalized so much so that it is a part of not only the American consciousness, but also the American practice. That there are people who can actually live most of their lives without, and, I'm, and here I'm referring to uh, my white sisters and brothers, who can live most of all of their lives without ever having to have a close, intimate friendship or acquaintance with a non-white person, because America um, allows for that to, to happen. And so there are some very real uh, implications uh, for CRT. One is to take a look at identity politics. And, and this I think is something we will certainly uh, discuss this evening because it, it is because of identity politics that CRT has become an issue. And, and we live with this rather ambiguous experience when it comes to uh, education and scholarship in America. On one hand, um, uh, we, meaning I think most uh, people understand that the value of a quality um, education is important to prepare one for a meaningful uh, work career life uh, as, as adults. But at the same time, uh, those, especially on the outside of the academy, meaning uh, higher education, are those who point their fingers at the academy or, or wave their finger at the academy and accuse those people of being um, just a bunch of pointed head people who are too smart for their own good. Hey, but, but where are some of the people that are trying to teach your children? 
what, what I'm trying to say is that the ambiguity here is that on one hand, we say that it is important to be learners. Then when uh, uh, research is uh, done and extracted and written about and talked about and presented for critical examination, we don't always like it. And, and here, here is the beauty. And, and maybe, maybe this is the fault of, of, of the academy uh, itself uh, using the descriptive critical, right? Because, um, you know, within many learning communities, critical simply means to think about or think upon, ask questions of. But outside of, of that community, oftentimes in uh, our regular ordinary community circles, when we hear, hear the, ter the term critical, we're thinking that it is something that is attempting to lay blame and judgment. And, and so maybe the language, the terminology is, is, is not working well here. Uh, so uh, again, the, some of the implications here for CRT is looking at identity politics because it is identity politics right now that is challenging CRT. CRT is simply saying, let's take a look at America's history and its social dynamics as it relates to uh, culture, as it relates to law, especially how, as it has impacted all lives, but how it has especially been damaging for non-white lives. That's what it's attempting to do. So the identity politics that come into play here are those who are saying, no, we don't like this. No, we don't agree with this. No, we think that um, there's some missteps here. Um, so that's problematic. And so people like the author, Robin DiAngelo, who uh, uh, writes in, in the book, White Fragility, the, the question that we should be looking at with regard to, to racism isn't whether or not racism takes place, but how to, how did or how does racism manifest itself? And, and we know that there's a plethora of examples uh, for that. Um, Ibram uh, Kendi, uh, who's written the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, talks about this as well. And, and he says that with regard to, to racism, what we need to do is identify it, describe it, and then dismantle it. Oh, am I looking forward to talking about that later on because <laughs> I have a suggestion or two if anyone is interested uh, in that. So I'll, I'll pause here because I well, well, some other thoughts that I like to share is how uh, critical race theory is being applied uh, in the classroom. And so uh, there are some things that I like to uh, present um, for us to think about tonight. But if you have a question or a comment you like um, to interject here, Larissa, I, I can call us. Yes, this is, oh, this is such a wonderful conversation and it's great to be able to talk about this. And I hope that we can all engage in conversations like this because it's so essential. Sure. Um, realize that it seems like we're talking about some high level philosophical terms also. Mm. Um, like for example, when we talk about um, the liberal order, um, we're we talking about politics or philosophy, like liberalism can be two very, very different things. Sure, sure. Um, so when we're talking about, see, and that's, that, that's the trickiness, right? It, it reminds me of the Affordable Health Care Act. So for those who like it, it's the Affordable Health Care Act. Those who don't like it, it's Obamacare, right? So when we're talking about identity politics and we're talking about, um, say, the Democratic Party, uh, if they're speaking about themselves for themselves, uh, many will de define or self-identify as progressives. But if there are those who uh, don't align with that, then they're referred to liberals because liberal is, is much more scary. Uh, the same can be said for, for, the, for, for the other side. So when, I, when I'm talking 
uh, liberal here. Um, I'm I'm talking really in some ways somewhere between the middle to the left because liberal from the perspective of CRT was a, has to do with how how do we reach a an understanding how do we write legislation and implement laws that are going to benefit people of color in the United States, not simply uh, for the purpose of having equality, but for equity, meaning that the long-term outcomes are going to be beneficial. So that's what I'm trying to say here. And then also, I was I'm wondering about identity politics too. I mean, is this something new or do we just talking about identity when it's not white? Yeah, so no, I, I think that it's an apt description for many people. Um, um, some, some scholars in uh, the critical race theory community um, label this as identitarianism. Uh, what happens when uh, people choose a side or take a position and firmly root themselves, attach themselves to a, a, a philosophy, an ideology, or a practice to such a degree that it leaves little, almost no room at all for a conversation. And so what we have, and, and this is not new, I, identity politics is not new. I, I would say that what has happened in recent years, especially since 2016, is that there's um, much more willingness to openly disagree and shout down uh, others who have a different view. You're muted, I think. My cursor is a little slow, but <laughs> I also was thinking that we're talking about a theory. So this mm -hmm. theory about that, um, that Professor Bell de uh, devised to explain what he was observing. Sure. And then you would use this theory to make sense of other like right. phenomena in the world. Yeah, so you're exploring Right, this is what theory is. We're exploring in an attempt to explain. So um, CRT will take a look at, say, integrated schools, and ask the question: Are into uh, 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 post Brown versus Board of Education, 1954 uh, Supreme Court decision, right? Uh, are integrated schools working? Was that the best approach? And what we what we learned from that was, on one hand, we thought we I was nowhere I wasn't even around in 1954. Not even a thought. What well, what those who were in, involved uh, in this um, at that time believed, as many did later on, was that segregated education was damning and damaging uh, for non-white students. And, and, and here, let's be real clear, we're mostly talking about African-Americans at that time because that was the largest ethnic minority group in the United States. Um, in, in, our, um, in, in our seminar, we use African-Americans as the paradigm group to help us to understand racism in America. Uh, certainly indigenous people were targeted first, but unfortunately because they were uh, displaced and, and, and mostly put aside, whereas African-Americans uh, post-Civil War um, in droves were integrating or attempting to integrate mainstream society, but experienced a humongous uh, backlash, uh, they are our paradigm group. So when schools started to become integrated, which, which 
many thought was a good idea. What happened in many of these uh, districts um, be beginning uh, in the South and not just the deep South, right? What began to happen was white parents took their children out of those schools and started new schools. Not only did they begin new public schools, therefore using public money, but in many places also started new private, specifically Christian schools, and were using public money to do so. So Bell is, is exploring that and asking the question, was that the, was, was, was integrating schools the right way to go? Um, we thought it was, we, we thought that was a, a progressive or, or liberal approach, but look what has happened now. And, and in many places for a long period of time, when the population of students went from white to say black to Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, then the quality of education began to, to drop. So yes, theory uh, to explore and explain. Oh, that's great. I think we, I, have, I have to switch off some loud machinery that's in my background, but please keep on talking. <laughs> okay. All right. So th then what about some of the uh, ways that this is applied um, in, in the classroom or applied uh, in um, mainstream uh, society? Uh, in, in some places, just talking about higher education here, so some institutions are looking at ways of changing its admission policies in an effort or an attempt to ensure that there's a, a greater equality of outcome uh, for, for university students, trying to, to again, help students pre pre get prepared not only for a, an experience of equality, but a life that is much more equitable. So looking at standardized tests and maybe uh, abolishing them. Well, we know during this pandemic, many colleges and universities did away with standardized tests and, and did not use them, but still admitted uh, students from all over the country into uh, their institutions. So looking at getting away uh, with standardized tests, um, because what they know is that that is not the absolute, it is not an absolute uh, uh, tell to determine whether or not a student has both ability and potential. Uh, so that's one of the things that, that's happening. Um, also, I would say that um, looking to implement anti-racism, bias, and diversity training um, onto college campuses and in, in workplaces is something that is not new, but continues to grow. And, and, and trust me, um, even with mandates, there's pushback um, uh, because there are people, some who really do not think that institutional racism or structural racism is even an issue uh, that it's a, that that it's a problem uh, at all. Um, it, it, I, I've I have found in my work that whenever I'm uh, I have to give a talk on diversity uh, and and, and inclusion, um, some people will say I'm not prejudiced. I'm not prejudiced. And then they begin to tell me about the number of, of friends that they have that don't look like themselves. <laughs> but to some degree, all human beings are, are, are prejudiced, but, you know, because our, our prejudice is, has to do with how the way we think. And, and in, and in um, different ways, we have been uh, taught and influenced to um, uh, some stereotypes about uh, different people. So diversity training, uh, is an attempt to introduce all persons, whether they're students or employees, to a 
more valued understanding about many kinds of people and how it is we can think and interact and engage and work collaboratively in a way whereby we affirm and respect one another. Simple as that. Simple as that. Not that complicated, right? Uh, but it, you know, those defenses are 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 there for sure. Some places, and I'm going to go back to now, um, colleges and universities are changing their curriculum requirements, whereby um, students have to, at minimum, take a diversity uh, course, uh, at least one, before uh, graduating. And, and there are different courses. Um, uh, in the past, I've taught uh, racism and sexism, uh, justice and racism, justice and sexism, um, uh, world religions, human geography, institutional racism. Uh, and these kinds of courses are intended to uh, provide academic learning for those who may not have had it before and for those who have. And, and doing so academically is really an attempt to teach from a fact-based scholarly platform. These are the facts. And this is what we're this is what we're asking you to think about as a critical thinker. Ask questions, challenge positions that are presented. And so, so we have that. Um, what else are we talking about? Um, well, we can. I could break in with a couple of. We have some questions. Yeah, uh, please. Floor. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got about four or five more more of, of these um, points of, of of implementation that I think are necessary, and I'll, I'll get there. And I think that this actually is one of the questions right now. Um, oh. Anthony is wondering where currently is CRT actually being employed or taught, um, including my own. There appears to be a lot of ignorance about this. Yeah. So, so he, he, let, let me let me respond to that in, in two ways. So, CRT is mostly being taught at the graduate level in in law schools, and it's being taught as a as a theory. CRT, if we if we just stripped away that acronym, if we removed the, the description of this theory, critical race theory, what we are talking about is teaching fact-based scholarship about the United States of America and its relationship with race and racism. So we we teach if if we're if we're doing this, then we're teaching about um, the brutality of Christopher Columbus. We're teaching about what uh, the historian Chorus, uh, um, Doris Kearns Goodwin stated uh, when she declared that the founding fathers, the framers of the Constitution, to a man, to a man, un unfortunately, they, women were, were not included as they should have been, to a man stated, that the institution of slavery was morally wrong, but economically profitable. That's just truth, right? So if we're, it, it, so, so take away the title CRT, remove that, and then talk about the Atlantic slave trade, talk about the institution of slavery, teach and write about the treatment of, of Native American people and, and their displacement and the genocide that was perpetrated upon them. Teach about uh, the Civil War, not um, from the perspective of Lincoln, Lincoln wanting to emancipate and, and, and liberate the enslaved people, but how uh, Lincoln wanted to save the Union. Uh, teach about uh, 
reconstruction, teach about the 13th, the 14th, the 15th Amendment. <laughs> so what I'm saying here from 16, but forget 1619, right? Even before 1619, teach the, 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 the true researched, established scholarship about America's relationship with race and racism. That's what we're talking about. And so where it's being taught is uh, in or on college campuses um, where you have courses like institutional racism or racism and sexism or US history one and two um, when it's taught um, uh, by someone who is including some of what I, I've stated just a moment uh, ago. So that's what we're talking about. That's where it's, it's being taught. Now, I said two things. I'm going to sneak a third, third one in here. Because the term CRT, and maybe this is really part of the first point, because the term CRT has become as one conservative uh, puts it, neutralized. It has also become in some ways demonized. So for those who are not speaking truthfully about what CRT is, what they are espousing is that critical race theory is black. I almost couldn't say that without laughing, is black racism. Yeah, what they are saying is that uh, this is a theory that is laced with, with mistruths, right? So that, that's challenge. That challenges some people because there are some who are much more comfortable with an American myth than they are with an American truth. Wow. Um, so we have a couple, we have, oh my gosh, we have some really good questions. So somebody is wondering, is there CRT outside of the United States? And it does it, is it getting the kind of attention it's getting here? It, it's, it's mostly an examination of race and racism in America. But like many institutions that um, care about um, global uh, politics and global relations, uh, it's beginning to find its its way in, in those classrooms as well. Yeah, and certainly there's so many other countries that have profited uh, in the oh. past from- Oh, the, sure. Okay, so. Hey, you, you, you know what's so strange and bizarre about that? And, and, and this, is, <laughs> this is something that many people are, are aware of. Race and racism in America is so much a part of the American experience that there are people who immigrate to the United States with an understanding that racism, they may not know the, the, the depth of the detail, but racism is a reality. And as a, as a, as a classroom instructor, uh, I've had, uh, we've had class discussions with uh, European immigrants and Southeast Asian immigrants who learned in their own countries that non-white people were not at the same social place as white people. And if you're European, what you want to do is identify with what it means to be white. If you're Southeast Asian, you want to identify with what it means to be white and never internalize or practice what it, what it means to think like and experience America as an ethnic minority. 
That reminds me of the Supreme Court cases in the beginning in the early what, 1900s or so, or what, when uh, they were, were really establishing, the justices were establishing what it is to be an American, what it is to be white too, because if you were black, you couldn't be a, a citizen at this, I forget exactly what year this was, but uh, there was, I think he was a, a Thai national who tried to gain citizenship and yes. well, we're gonna put you over here in this box, so. Right, right. Right. And 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 th this is this is real. This is a part of the American experience that um, that many are not familiar with or do not want to um, have to consider because what what it does is it challenges. For some people, it challenges their loyalty. It challenges what they uh, understand it, what it means to be a patriot. And what it also does is it challenges us to, um, to honor truth. And, and, and the, the reality of the harsh experience that people have endured and are um, experiencing even even now. Well, it's interesting that maybe that you also brought up um, Southeast Asians too, because somebody is wondering about um, Asian Americans and their relationship with um, CRT, because they, the, they, that group of people doesn't seem to be, or that Asian Americans as a group don't seem to be mentioned. That yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad that that, that was raised. Um, and I thought about this, um, a few months back, unfortunately, when uh, our Asian sisters and brothers were being targeted and, and, and attacked, and how heartbreaking um, is it to have to, to, to live in a country that we believe is um, a, a land of, of freedom and, and, and rights, but to be targeted uh, to be uh, uh, beaten and killed because of the melanin in one's skin, uh, because of one's racial features and ethnic practices. And so, unfortunately, what we um, witnessed uh, not that long ago was much more visible to us because of social media, but we know that historically, um, uh, sisters and brothers who self-identify as AAPI uh, have always been challenged um, for full inclusion in the United States of America. So much so that immigration law were, were rewritten to exclude um, many from entering. I'm thinking about how after many Chinese immigrants helped to lay the tracks for America's um, uh, Continental Railroad um, were excluded or prevented from entering the country. Um, um, and, and so what happens here is that uh, some of our South Asian um, sisters and brothers uh, are also a part of this conversation if they do not self-identify as white Americans uh, because they too are, are persons who have to ask whether or not race and racism has worked to their disadvantage. Now, while on one hand, Culturally, the U.S. has had a relationship whereby uh, it has wanted to limit the number of Southeast Asian persons from uh, living as full and free persons in our country. While on the other hand, we celebrate some members of that group and we refer to them as the model citizens because they work hard and they do well and they take care of their families and they contribute to the economy 
uh, and the culture of, of our country. So yes, persons who are not white, persons who are white, we are all a part of critical race theory. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be hard. Uh, I don't know why I'm getting that echo, but it can be hard to um, get hung up a little, or not hung up necessarily, but to have this hierarchy of oppression or um, racism or, or uh, prejudice. Mm -hmm. And that, um, it's, I know that it's, it can't be easy to say, look, you know, look who has it worse or whatever, sure. but right. I, I can imagine that, but CRT of regarding the African American experience is is different because um, African Americans were in, white people enslaved African Americans that mm -hmm. people and that was um, for four hundred years and that is very very different than the kind of oppression that pretty much any other group experienced. Sure, Be because people of African descent, or or let's go back to the enslaved persons did not come here voluntarily, did not come here uh, as refugees. These were persons who were either purchased, traded for, or kidnapped, brought intentionally uh, to the colonies, uh, to the, uh, the, the, the Caribbean for the sole purpose of satisfying a free labor system and were treated brutally, treated in, inhumanely. Um, uh, even, even when they were working uh, diligently. You, you know, so, sometimes I, 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 I think about uh, African-Americans and, and often uh, they are understood as a race group. African-Americans, yeah, they can be a race group, but they're, they're mostly an ethnic group um, because one would be hard pressed. And, and I, I'm, I'm leaning on uh, the, the uh, genetic research of the Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. here, one would be hard pressed to find an African American whose DNA is 100% African. African American people are multiracial people because during the institution of slavery, um, there were a lot of plantation owners who believed that the uh, enslaved women and men were their property and they did what they chose to do with them by doing harm to their bodies. Um, and, and therefore there were children that were born uh, to enslaved women um, uh, uh, who were, um, uh, by, because they were impregnated by plantation owners, overseers, um, sons of plantation owners and, and so forth. And I should also, when we were talking about Asian Americans, that, that there is uh, the model minority concept that um, that people are, that their certain racial group is um, just always like get really good in math or never has any social problems or right. um, always makes, you know, works good in technology or something like that can be oppressive in itself too. Mm -hmm. and oh, it, sure. Types can be limiting and- yes really not, not helpful for the full gamut. No, not, not at all. Yeah, listen, part, part of this theory is, is also, again, looking at social dynamics, trying to understand how and why it is we objectify people based on race. And, <laughs> and again, there are people who are uncomfortable with that notion. But the reality is that part of American culture is identifying people based on their race, identifying characteristics, and then exaggerating them, turning them into stereotypes, and therefore giving people permission to minimize the humanity of, of persons. And, and we, we do this in, in our country. So um, uh, on, on one side, we're saying, boy, isn't that person, the, 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 the person that's really good at math and biology and a, and a phenomenal violin player, isn't that person wonderful? But then we turn and 
to, to, to the other side and say, yeah, you know, there goes that Asian kid. I mean, how horrible. But this is what, what we do in our, in, our, in our country, in our culture. We minimize people based on, on these stereotypes. Okay, I'm just trying to see if we have anything else that kind of gets to this. Well, while, you're, while you're getting to it, let me, let me say a couple of uh, other things here that, that uh, critical race theory also uh, attempts to do. Um, it, it attempts to support uh, anti-racism um, uh, activity. So while on one hand, there's going to be information about an organization whether it's the NAACP core or the Black Lives Matter movement that has a clear uh, mission statement. Uh, CRT is, a, is going to support those organizations and those agencies as they strive to also uh, work with the legal system to improve the quality of life for uh, people of color. But you know, at the same time, they're, they're, they're going to be, as there always has been, people who are going to attack those organizations and those agencies and label them as something that they are not. So that's something that CRT uh, also uh, strives, strives to do. And then, and, and I'll say a couple more here while, while you're uh, gathering some other questions. Um, critical race theory, also wants to reimagine policing in America. We, we know that uh, George Floyd was murdered by a police officer. We know that other uh, black people, uh, Breonna Taylor, we know that other uh, uh, persons have been killed uh, by police officers uh, who not only did not adhere to proper uh, policy uh, and approaches, but because of the culture of racism in America, were empowered to devalue a black body, a brown, a brown body. Um, I, I, this past Sunday, I had the responsibility of, of teaching from, from the pulpit. And uh, I, I, I stated that, um, Part of what has happened in our country is that the institution of slavery um, and um, what it means to be poor has taught America how to devalue non-white people, how to devalue poor people. And so even within, and, and this, and again, I'm, I'm not speaking exclusively here, but within uh, uh, the policing community, there are two, there are many, many things happening here, but on one hand, there is this understanding that the world outside of us or on the other side of our shield is dangerous. There are bad people out there. Our job, our responsibility is to take them down. At the same time, you have working what I've just stated, that many of those bad people are black, they are brown, they are poor, and we've got to take them down. That's horrible for an institution that has a responsibility to provide care for citizens and residents who are paying for the institution to be in existence, right? So CRT wants to reimagine policing and, and one of the ways of reimagining policing or any other institution is to examine the culture in those institutions. And I'm not talking ethnic culture, I'm talking about the societal culture, the work culture in a particular environment. Is it a culture that affirms and, and values human beings, or is it one that is um, uh, influenced 
by uh, prejudice and discrimination and the abuse of, of power. Well, that gets into another another person's question is, what is the goal of understanding CRT? What is, I guess, today, what's the point of this conversation today? I don't know who you are, but I'm so glad you asked that question. I don't know. This, <laughs> this afternoon, um, I taught um, a sociology class, and the topic was uh, socialization and social interaction, socialization and social interaction. And for the sociologists that are that are in uh, this gathering tonight, know and others know that there are many different uh, what we describe as socialization agencies or socialization agents or um, institutions or or units, family, uh, peers education, uh, media, just to name a few. And so in our discussion this afternoon, we talked about which agency has the most important job, which one has the most influence in terms of teaching us what our norms and our values and our beliefs are, which one teaches us how to live and without any hesitation, these students said, family. No matter what the construct of the family is, a traditional family, a blended family, however it looks, whatever it feels like, it is that unit that is mostly responsible for who we become. It is in that unit where we can either be taught how to disregard or embrace. We can be taught how to stereotype or get to know. And so what happens from the very outset is that in some families, intentionally and unintentionally, children, babies who become toddlers, become adolescents, become preteens, and Teens learn prejudice, learn how, how to discriminate. They, they learn how to elevate their own status and diminish other people. So what do we get out of this? Well, what we, what we get, I think, I hope, is an understanding that people are objectified and are diminished, are uh, are disconnected because of race and racism. If the agents of socialization, family, religion, education, peer, media group, the political community, if these agents of socialization do a better job, we're not having this conversation tonight. So in short, it's we're here because we want to make the world a better place. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, and listen, <laughs> we're we're sitting in our square boxes. My 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 Emmanuel family, and uh, and my uh, race together family know that I'm six foot one, and I weigh more than I should. I'm about two twenty on a on a good day. I'm not a small fella. And so I'm, I'm, I say that to say that what we're talking about here is not some fairy tale, Pollyanna hope that someday there'll be love and kindness and rainbows around every corner. I'll go for that pot of gold. Uh, we, we're not talking about something that is uh, unattainable. Um, Martin King, when he writes about and talks about love, he says he, he's not talking about a simply a sentimental 
romantic notion of love, but he's talking about the serious business of what it means to respect and affirm the humanity of all human beings. Yes, so I'm echoing, Larissa, what, what you just stated, make the world a better place. Doggone it, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that ought to be our marching orders, make the world a better place. And we do that uh, in and within our families. We do that uh, in our school systems. And I'm going to pause right here on, on schools because schools, particularly public schools, it is the only institution whereby most people have to participate in. Most people don't have to affiliate themselves with a civic organization or religious organization. Most people don't have to tune into media. They don't have, but most people from K through 12, all things being normal, have to go through a systematic learning process, wouldn't it be something if on that journey from K through 12 at minimum, because what's happening is um, some of what we're talking about here tonight, some students aren't getting it until they get onto college campuses. I, I've had students say to me, how is it that I'm just learning this now? And it's because from K to 12, they didn't get it. And it's because in their families, they didn't get it. And in other places, they didn't get it. And what we're, what we're talking about getting is a more truthful, inclusive understanding about the value of all human beings. And uh, on that note, also there's another question. And first, and also I should mention that for some reason the chat doesn't seem to be working. So I see that people have added a lot of comments to the Q and A, which is great. And I will click those things as 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 answered, so they'll show up in the answered column. Um, okay. If somebody does not see that, please message me. Um, but uh, somebody is asking, when will there be no need for CRT? What will the U.S. be like? And, Oh boy, oh boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? It's going to be wonderful when that happens. Uh, what, what, what it will be like when there's no need, excuse me, for that is what happens when we do a better job at our jobs, um, when we recognize that we can teach the history about Columbus's exploration that included genocide. When we can teach that the founding fathers uh, who decided to start a revolution and establish a country uh, also owned human being, um, we will be at a better place when people are given more equitable opportunities in our everyday uh, lived experience. Let's see. On the flip side of that, somebody is wondering, is CRT going back to segregation? That's a good question because, you know, it's, it's a question that, that Derek Bell um, was, was asking. You know, are we, are we better when we, when our schools are segregated? Are our schools better function better when they're all black 
all Latino, all white? No, absolutely not, right? Are we going back there? No, I really do not uh, think that that's a good idea. I think that um, that is a lazy approach. Um, it does not help communities to grow and evolve. I think that um, evolution of any kind, including a legal and cultural evolution requires hard work. Um, it requires being able to both compromise and concede for the greater good of the more, but we have to be willing to do those kinds of things. I, I think about sometimes um, school systems, right? I'm thinking about large school system. Let's say that they are predominantly white. Let's say they are upper middle income. Um, and therefore most, if not all of their faculty members, by faculty members, I'm talking about classroom teachers and administrators are mostly white. And I've heard some say, well, our demographics of, 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 of students um, are, are almost exclusively white. And so that's why um, our administrators and our, our um, uh, teaching faculty are, are white. Um, not good enough, not good enough. No, not at all. I think that even in places like that, there, are, there ought to be more people of color in positions of leadership and authority. At the same time, in places where the largest population are people of color, there need to be white faculty people and white administrators in those places, right? We, we, we have to do, I think, a much better job at understanding the benefit of multiculturalism. You know, some people are challenged and, and they may not say it out loud. I get permission to say things out loud because I'm invited uh, to, to gatherings like this and I have to teach uh, in, in, in front of students. But what drives some of this is ethnocentrism. Um, even if people are not um, fully aware that they are um, or can spell it, or what I identify with it. What I'm talking about here is what happens when an individual and or an individual who is a part of a group actually think that his or her group is superior to other groups. And, and, and in the United States, we're mostly talking about um, what sociologists describe as the dominant white majority. And so for many uh, that fit that description, they actually do think and believe that they are superior, they are uh, entitled, um, and therefore what they think and what they want is the way of every community. I'm a taxpayer, I'm a citizen, uh, therefore I have the right to want my school, uh, my children's education and educators to look this way, at the detriment by the way, of their children. But you know, if a person has gone that far, then we ought not to uh, be afraid to just say that they're racist, that we ought not to be afraid to say that they are a, a white supremacist here, right? Or, or, and, or a nationalist, someone who thinks that uh, they and they alone are entitled uh, to um, the wealth and the opportunities of, of this nation. Uh, but multiculturalism uh, is, is an imperative because it, in, it, it affirms and embraces the, di the dignity of, of human beings from uh, many different uh, uh, groups. That was beautiful. Um, but, but yes, and I think that it also it's easier for um, for in a white supremacist society to define what is law and order. Oh. And so that we can say it's being upheld or we can say it's being violated, but I never get 
Sidetrack. Well, you, you, owe, you, you know, law and order is just code. We talked about that last week in our seminar. Law and order is just code for I'm going to be tough on crime and I'm going to keep those black and brown people, those undesirable people in their place and away from you because after all, you are the hardworking people and we're going to affirm your culture. Oh, I mean, it just, it, 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 it just, I had to, I have to recite that, but it hurts to even say it. Right? Well, it's even it tough on just like certain kinds of crime too. Yes, yes. Kinds of crime just right, right. But it's not see, crime that impoverishes, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. But uh, right. Well, well, the, well to, to your point, this is what CRT is looking at. How is it? Why is it that a gram of of crack cocaine, uh, someone who um, that gets arrested for a gram of crack cocaine is penalized, punished more harshly than someone with a gram of raw coke. Well, we know that the 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 the, the crack cocaine was mostly in um, inner city urban communities, whereas that raw coke was used, snorted by affluent, wealthier white people who had an ability to lawyer up. So now we're bringing in again, the criminal justice system. And the CRT uh, is, is looking at that. And people like Michelle Alexander, who lays it out in her book, The New Jim Crow, as well as others, the, the, the criminal justice system is not a fair and equal institution in the United States of America. But there are people who are not aware of this. There, there are people who, um, uh, because of a lack of understanding, make leaps and are quickly to side with sentencing that in, in many ways is certainly unjust. Yeah, and I a but note about this, I think that for many white people, uh, like I, I'm a white person and I've been on this journey also that sometimes these conversations can be like, um, and these explorations can be like finding out that you actually speak with an accent, that <laughs> you are, um, the, you are swimming in water, it's clear, you can't see it, but it is there. Mm. And um, once that we become aware of this and through CRT um, is one tool that, it can help us see the world, I think, more accurately. Sure, sure. Actually, based on, on that, I, there are a couple of questions about education, and I know that oh. we're just, oh gosh, and, and there are really great media questions about um, relating kind of to what we're doing here. There's so much disinformation regarding CRT, mainly due to right wing media. Um, people who attend presentations like these try to educate themselves about the theory, but that is a small group a small but powerful group uh, in society. How can we stop the disinformation while educating more people so that they are not fearful of CRT? Yeah, thank, thank you for that question. It's, it's wonderful. Um, here, here's, here, here's a way that may help. Even when there is something presented that um, has been that is credible. If there is a side that views it as a threat, doesn't agree with it, it is going to find a way to attack it and discredit it. And that's kind of where we are with, with CRT. So what do we do about that? What do we do with it? I think that what we do is give ourselves permission to be the critical thinkers that we need to be individually and collectively. Uh, individually, we have to go and reach out for uh, sources that are going to inform us, that are going to stretch us, that we're going to agree with and disagree with. We don't, we don't wanna agree with everything. We don't want our biases to be confirmed. Uh, so, so there's work that we can do there. I think trusting, finding institutions that we that we can trust. This platform, I think, is exceptional. Uh, the Ridgewood 
uh, library is not Republican, it's not Democrat. It is a public institution that is presenting uh, forums and viewpoints to give people an opportunity to, to listen, to learn, to engage uh, by asking questions and making comments. Uh, and then we collaborate. We collaborate with each other through a platform like this. I, I tell you, the, the, the work that we're doing um, uh, with the Community Peace and Justice Network, the, the, the racism seminar, in, in my professional work life, um, this is probably the most profound work I've ever done. And, and I've, been, I've been incredibly uh, fortunate and blessed to, to do some exceptional kinds of things. But this, um, I get energized to do this more than I've been energized to do anything else. Because what, what it does is it gives us an opportunity to do some reading. Um, God bless our participants because they, they show up once a month every uh, every third Tuesday and 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 listen to me and and we engage with each other uh, and then in between each of our seminars, Larissa, we do something called a midway moment where people are in smaller conversations. Oh, to me, that is as important as anything else we do because that's where the real hard work is happening, having conversations with our neighbors having conversations with people who have different viewpoints. And so the collaboration is, 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 is important. And, and it's, it's, it's at the ground roots level. And at the ground roots level is where activism begins. And so out of that work and out of the work of different uh, community organizations, um, those uh, agencies develop what their um, target of activism is going to be. So if there's an organization or an agency that says, you know, uh, the Rudrup public school system is, is a very good school system. Uh, students get receive a, a, a quality education. But you know, I think that we need more people of color as educators, as administrators. Uh, perhaps we need a diversity and inclusion uh, a director. That's, that's what we do. We, we identify race and racism and we dismantle it. That's what we do. So I, I first, I just need to mention to everybody, there are some wonderful comments. There's so many wonderful comments and questions. And I really, I don't even, I think we're going to have to do something like this again, just to get through this, just these meaty conversations, because we could really have a, just a fascinating time. Um, and, uh, but a, a couple of the other questions, in fact, just what you're talking about dealing with the Ridgewood school system, um, somebody is wondering, and you might not uh, know this, but whether the Ridgewood school system, considering implementing CRT at the elementary slash middle slash high school level and if it is doing so when will it do so and like I said I don't know if you happen to know that off the top of your head yeah you know I don't know I I do think that it is important and necessary to to look at the um, structured curriculum and uh, determine whether or not it is uh, satisfactory uh, because what I've been talking about up to now is what we would call the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is how we are socialized in our uh, um, school systems. Um, children who only see educators that look one way, that's they're being socialized, right? So we're looking at the core curriculum or organized curriculum and the hidden curriculum. and um, we need to determine um, what approaches um, need to be, be considered. You know, when I was in the third grade, uh, our teacher was uh, preparing us uh, for a play that uh, we were going to have to rehearse. And, 
people were going to take different parts. And she read the names of the different characters and what their roles were. And I'll never forget, the play was about the Boston Tea Party. And um, she had described who Crispus Attucks was. Well, you know, at the very beginning of the play, Crispus Attucks gets shot. He's dead. I volunteered for Chris to be Crispus Attucks. My one and only onstage performance, I lost my theatrical life. But learning at an early age that the one and only Black person was the person that got killed did not cause me to hate white people. It didn't cause me to devalue myself as an African-American. There are some parents, mostly white parents in our country who are afraid that if their children learn about race and racism in America, that it will cause them to devalue themselves. I think you said we had about 68 participants in, in this gathering. I wish we had at least 68 million because what I would like to say is learning the truth does not have to devalue our humanity. Well, that's beautiful. Um, and speaking of learning the truth, um, Lynn says most adults have never learned the history. I, I think she's talking about U.S. history, and uh, I'm certainly every time I listen to a new podcast, I think, "How did I get this far without learning this?" But how do we address that? Just this lack of understanding, knowledge. Yeah. Um, well, I'll come back. I won't come back tomorrow, but I'll come back. And and there there's so many different platforms. You know, there are now, even before the pandemic, but certainly uh, during the pandemic, there are. Uh, colleges and universities all over the country that are now providing um, different courses at no cost or a minimal fee. Um, though that's one way. Um, I, I, you know, th there's good scholarship that that's available to us when we give ourselves permission to read to listen. Um, because we're, we're still the ones that are going to have to make our own choices with this. Um, I, I say um, seek out, listen to, read objective sources. And there are plenty. Um, I, I, I'm a believer in um, public media whether it's podcast, radio, or television, I think that uh, they make a very good effort of simply presenting the information, be it news or history, and say, this is what we've uncovered for you to consider. Um, we have to make those choices and, and, and for those who are not sure beyond that, um, take a look around and, and listen to, to some others. Um, there are some who are uh, writing, teaching in a, in a way that I think um, challenges us to give serious thought without um, being overbearing and judgmental, right? Because no one wants to feel that way either. Right, and I think that Lynn also might be talking about more uh, also just how do we get the next generations, uh, do we address this lack of knowledge so that we can stop just turning people out of schools who don't or weren't aware of like the most, some of the most significant aspects of US history. Yeah, well, that, see, and that's what I mean about um, the, the, the um, uh, public education because that's a, that is a systematic uh, academic process. And so if we are, if we are teaching from an, a diverse and inclusive 
multicultural perspective, then what we're doing is we are nurturing learners along the way of their development. So when they're 18, 19, 20 years old, they're not surprised and amazed when they discover that uh, racism is terrifying people's lives. You know, for all the vitriol that was hurled at the Black Lives Matter movement, especially during the protest after the George Floyd murder, how many people watched online or on their television at the number of young people who were not Black? And that's because many of them had the benefit of a uh, diverse and inclusive um, life experience even before something like that happened. So systematic, systematic, systematic is, is, is the, the operative here for me because education is the only institution that every single one of us in America has to travel through. I can be a teacher uh, on the campus at William Patterson University and I only teach those who come. I can be a teacher at Emmanuel, but I only teach those who will come. If I'm a teacher in, in uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, they have to come. They will be there. And for public schools, Eileen had mentioned this also that uh, in one of her comments that the Amistad um, mandate also applies to children being educated at least in public schools in New Jersey, if not private schools. I'm not sure uh, how the law applies there, but that also specifies certain um, curriculum and lessons for each grade. Yes. And, and so that work, th th there's, there's good work that that is being done. But like everything else, it has to be attended to. It has to be attended to. Um, when, when I think about where we are with voting rights in America, then we, we some thought that the 1964 uh, uh, um, Voting Rights Act was finally going to hold the 14th Amendment to the Constitution accountable. And here we are in 2021, and there are states in our country that are attempting to make it more difficult for people to vote under the using using the position that they want to make certain that people are qualified to vote. But truthfully, we know that they know that those voters that they are wanting to restrict are not likely to vote for them. Well, certainly we uh, approached other um, potential risks that have not yet panned out with as much determination and energy and money and time as um, people have been approaching um, these um, voting restriction laws. And um, we would be able to solve a whole lot of other problems too. Mm, sure. But as I should really stick to the CRT, because I know, know that we're going over a little bit over time, but there are just a couple last things. Eileen Khan mentioned also that, and a few other people had talked to me about how the League of Women Voters is encouraging people to use, a dip, use different terminology for critical race theory. I'm not sure if that is just at the college level, college and uh, postgraduate level, but it's an elementary school level, but I don't know if you wanted to mention that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, that, that's what I, um, mentioned uh, earlier that I think that the, um, the term is what has, it's, it's been a bit of an obstacle. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't invited some people in, but, but understand something. Critical race theory is just the term. And, and again, maybe the critical part is what throws some people off, but Here's what's ha what happened. It only became a challenging descriptive because those who participate in identi identity politics made it so. They targeted critical race theory. They targeted CRT. And what they did 
and 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 I'll I'll use I'll use this descriptive only because my mother's not present. They bastardized the term. That's what they that's what they've done. They they've made it something that it was never intended to be and is not. So do the proponents of critical race theory need to reconsider? That's up to them to decide. Um, but I, I think that for those whose introduction to critical race theory is, oh, this is something horrible. This is something that's evil. This is something that isn't good for our children. They are those who are going to have difficulty with the, with the name. Yeah, in some ways, I'm not sure if that would really help deal with underlying problem, which would be just um, that it's a, like as people have said, a dog whistle um, kind of, or a tool, maybe yeah. because like, why is it suddenly, why is it, are we suddenly talking about it? Why is it suddenly in the news? Yeah. I think we can probably dig back into maybe some Google searching to see when it first started coming up most recently. Yeah. It, it, it go, it, I think that it has a lot to do with identity politics. Listen, I, I referenced nationalism a little earlier this evening. There, there are people who are actually threatened by the growth, the numerical growth and the, and the economic growth as slow as it is of non-white people in this country. And anything that they think is going to help non-white people to do better and compete is a threat. Our, our economic system is capitalism. It's the one we have, but it's super ultra competitive. And what people do not want is competition. People don't want competition when it comes to their wealth and their status in the United States of America. And if CRT, critical race theory, call it anything you want, if that is going to um, help others to become competitors, not welcomed by some. Yeah, and I should also mention that I know that I, I must also to everybody here, I must sound like I have a certain political um, agenda or view, and I really want to uh, guarantee that I am interested in every single question here. And I do have some beliefs like, you know, racism is bad and multiculturalism good and things like that. Um, so yeah, so that if that's political, then that I probably am bringing a political mindset, but I, yeah, I think there's certain basic things that we can just accept as true. Um, and somebody else is one now, I think this will be your last one. This is another, there are also some other comments, but um, they are more getting a, just, a, just onto this huge other issues, all the other issues that surround this, but is Black Lives Matter embracing CRT? CRT is embracing Black Lives Matter. That's, yeah, I could see, yes. Um, yeah, because that's probably where it started. Yes. So, um, and then uh, let's see. Uh, and then, then Christina is also wants us to uh, mention again, just about the, uh, let me see, let me get your point again, um, that CRT is uh, not, I'm sorry, I'm just, the chat has gotten very, very tiny, that uh, CRT is not, wait, in an elementary school level, would it be possibly included um, I'm sorry, this is just, this is, so it seems it would be prudent to clarify that CRT in an elementary and low level education, K-12 would be possibly included in the curriculum um, at age appropriate material. Um, so, okay, so this was, yeah, I think this was a little while ago, somebody had mentioned this, but yes, so children are not gonna be learning CRT. This is something that's happening at the college and postgraduate level. Well, and well, they might get something like social emotional learning, SEL. Right, right. So, so if, if we're, we're what we're what we're talking about is the history and the social impact, the cultural impact, 
the legal impact of race and racism in America. So in elementary school, children should learn the truth about the institution of slavery in America in a way that is appropriate for children to learn about the institution of slavery in America. That, that is not something uh, that should be held off until someone becomes a college student. Yeah, and that certainly is addressed by the Amistad, at least attempted to be addressed, yes. that uh, mandate. And I what, don't know if you, I, I, there still are other comments and um, we please check our, if you're looking for other um, resources, of course, see Arturo's uh, the webpage, um, the Community Peace and Justice Network for their seminars, their upcoming seminars, other resources, their podcast. Um, and as you probably know, I'm going to recommend books and, but there are other movies and podcasts and TV shows and um, all kinds of fascinating things out there to just broaden your mind and your um, ideas and your thinking and show what could be and um, just help us all grow as, as um, people. And I would like you to also, if, if you're interested, you can check our social justice page um, on the, the Ridgewood Public Library for other ideas. Please email me if you have any questions or are you looking for anything or if you have any comments about tonight's um, program, I'd uh, love to hear your ideas and your comments. And Arturo, I'd like to give you this chance to yeah, address anything else that you'd like to mention and we can uh, get, we can wrap up this wonderful evening. Well, I listen again, I just wanna say thank you for the invitation. It's been an honor to be here with you to have a conversation, to talk about a very important topic. Um, I, I am so thankful to be a part of a community of people that um, are concerned and interested uh, in this topic and in the well being of all people. And I think that the more we are willing to learn and work together collaboratively, uh, the more we can do to improve the quality of life for, uh, for each other. And uh, yes, come and, come and spend some time with us, um, Community Peace and Justice network.org is our website and uh, we love to have you come and uh, be with us. Larissa, I really appreciate being with you tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you everybody else for being here and for sticking out um, for this long too. And we'll be, I'll be able to put the recording up probably by Thursday or so. Um, if not tomorrow evening, just takes a long, little bit of time for, to process the recording. Um, but so please, you can uh, check our website again, see uh, what other programs you come up with. If you have any ideas for any other programs, how you'd like to continue this conversation or anything else you're interested in, please email me um, or give us a call at the library or stop by and just say hello to us at the uh, second floor in the reference. And thank you so much, Arturo. I hope you have a lovely evening. It has been such a treat. We really appreciate all your time and your thought and your energy. Thank you. Thank you. And good, good night, night everyone. everybody.